Oh boy, another Christmas upon us. I wonder if I should finally get to reviewing Hearthswarming Club like I said I was going to do last year. I mean, I've done all the Hearthswarming episodes already. Except the big one. Did someone say Christmas? What the hell? There's reindeer now? Why does every creature want to break into my race shop? <laughs> it's gift giver protocol. And since they're busy getting things ready for the holidays, you got me. Also, hi, FD. All right, I guess that makes sense. Even though I don't have any cookies out. Also, hey, Fauna. So, uh, I'm gonna cut to the chase since you broke into my shop. Are you up for reviewing Horse Warming Club with me in time for the holidays? Of course. It's my second favorite MLP holiday special besides the best gift ever, obviously. Hmm, couldn't tell. But regarding Hearth Warming Club, I absolutely enjoyed this Season 8 episode, especially since it aired after May, unlike Season 6's Hearth Warming episode. Seriously, what were you thinking, Discovery family? Plus, it's a great look into how the other creatures of Equestria celebrate their holidays. Yep, and that's exactly one of the many reasons I adored this episode, other than the mystery element that frames the entire story, of course. In fact, I'd say this is up there with Hearthswarming Tale and Best Gift Ever as the best Hearthswarming Eve episode. Not that there are any bad ones, of course. So we start off seeing the students at Twilight School getting ready for the holidays. Reminding the students that Hearthswarming Eve is about having fun with friends and family to keep the fire of friendship burning. And to symbolize it, she reveals a tree with the fire of friendship on top. Okay, so I really like the way this opening bit perfectly sets into motion how we'll learn about the students' unique ways of celebrating the holidays by starting out with the pony of the student six, Sandbar, singing about horse warming and inviting every other creature specifically to sing along. The reactions of his friends, especially Yona, is a great starting point for a story like this painting an early picture that she, Smolder, Ocellus, Gallus, and Silverstream don't celebrate like Sandbar does. After the student six tell Sandbar they celebrate the holidays differently, Twilight dismisses the students for the break, while Smolder, Ocellus, Gallus, Sandbar, and Silverstream go to their dorms and get ready to go home for the holidays. A strange figure sabotages the hearthwarming tree with a sticky purple slime. Well, great. The Phantom broke out of the opera to terrorize the School of Friendship. Though, being serious, the cut before the theme song is honestly hilarious. I love how the wave of sticky purple slime is heading for Spike, threatening to swallow him up, but then we cut to the song, then it cuts back to the episode, and then we see Spike getting swept up by the mess. It's really great editing that adds a touch of humor to a rather disheartening event like ruining holiday decorations. Well, Spike is a comedic relief after all. Anyway? True, and it was great how Rainbow managed to dodge the tsunami of slime and Twilight shielded herself, then she had to use her magic to rip the goo off Spike. After getting Spike cleaned up, they chase the culprit off to the students' quarters, just as the students are getting ready to go home. Uh, you know, the dialogue here is just a little weird to be perfectly honest, Fauna. When the culprit runs into the school, Spike points out that they're running into the students' quarters like you said. Though, I just found it to be strange that Spike tells two of the ponies that helped build the entire school which building it was the culprit ran into. I mean, of course they would know what building it was. It just seemed a little redundant the way he phrased it versus what we saw on screen. It would have felt a little more natural if he had said something more like, they're heading for the students' quarters, instead of... That's the students' quarters! It's true, but I think he got too caught up in the moment. Eh, you're right. It's more of a nitpick anyway. Regardless, once Twily, Dash, and Spike get into the building, they can't find the culprit, and the only ones in the building were the student six themselves. All the students are culprits. Twilight tells them that the one responsible will have to stay during the holiday break and go to one-on-one -on -one friendship lessons, and if none of them confess, they all have to stay. Wait, is that legal? Didn't a world war almost start because the student six didn't want to go home? Why, do you really want to start a war on one of Equestria's most important holidays? Well, it is an independently run school, so I'm sure the law won't ride Twilight. But I had the same thought about her idea of keeping them over the holiday break. Even if she explained the reasoning, I'm not too sure the guardians of the students would have been happy about it. Besides, who knows how long it would take to get word to the likes of Silverstream's parents, Ocellus's parents, Yona's parents, Ember, etc. 
I do think keeping all of them is a little extreme, however. I mean, one staying over, I can kinda see the logic in that, but all of them? I think assigning them extra homework over the break plus detention for the rest of the school year would have worked just fine. Not to mention, all six of them had to clean up the mess anyway. You know Book Horse, she never misses a learning moment. So, as the students are cleaning up the mess, Twilight calls back Gallus to be interrogated. While they argue asking who did it, Osalis insists it wasn't her, especially since Heartswarming Eve is her favorite holiday. Well, since last year. We learned that after the Changelings were reformed, Twilight sent them a letter about how to celebrate the holidays. Though they take the instructions a bit too literally, they enjoy it and manage to make the holiday their own. Also, it's great to see that the Changelings have families now. You know, even if they are all probably siblings, scientifically speaking. Yeah, and this is where my adoration for the episode really kicks in. While it has an element of mystery and a whodunit theme to it, we're also presented both character development for our student six and world building for each of their species. We're getting a holiday episode, plus a mystery episode, and the fleshing out of newer characters and worlds outside of Equestria. This episode, even though we're only on Ocellus' story for the time being, really has a lot to offer for people who like all kinds of story genres. Information hogs like me! Plus, it is an important lesson for kids that not all people celebrate the same way as them. And this picks up beautifully from Yoda and Smolder's reactions to Sandbar asking them all to join him in horsewarming singing earlier. Even if the changelings themselves take Twilight's instructions a little too seriously. It doesn't say how long we keep doing this. <laughs> Are we being too literal? They're still celebrating the holidays in their own unique way, which, like you said, Fauna, is a great illustration that not everyone's celebration is the same. This is especially true since all the students celebrate different holidays at the same time, which sort of makes this a soft sequel to Hearthbreakers. But things only get more interesting from here. After Arcellus tells her tradition, she is called back to be questioned next. Gallus comes back and says he's innocent. The pressure gets to Yona as she's worried she won't be able to celebrate with her family. She tells him about the Yaks holiday called Snimderfest. The Yaks go to collect things to smash for the holidays. As they do this, they sing a carol that very much reminds me too much of the song that doesn't end. But anyway, after they finish smashing things, they gather together as a family. Last year in particular, Yona's family braided her hair for the first time. It's funny, it almost sounds like a coming of age ritual. You know, it does actually. And I like how we also find out Yona has two siblings in her story and that the Yaks also value something other than smashing random objects or snow forts. I also saw the writing straying into the meta territory where Yona's friends become the audience, where they expect her holiday is nothing but smashing shit. Kind of like how a lot of the audience members of the fandom see the Yaks as nothing more than one-dimensional smashers. However, we're shown that that's only a fraction of their values. Family is extremely important to them since Yona's story had three generations of family participating in the ritual, so it shows us that this runs very deep within the Yaks. Smolder starts getting mad that she'll have to miss the holidays. Silverstream mentions how she thought dragons didn't celebrate holidays as Sandbar is called back. Smolder explains they have something called the Feast of Fire, a time when the dragons come together and tell stories. But these stories are more like when Vikings are talking about a hunt. They enjoy hearing stories of weak creatures being defeated. Jeez. Okay, and here we come to my favorite of the Student Six tales. The way Smolder starts out as a downer with a dragon being left out in the cold and rain, then becomes heartwarming, only to turn absolutely friggin' diabolical with the dragon usurping the Dragon Lord's Bloodstone Scepter was amazing. And how Smolder looked so happy telling it while her friends had horrified looks on their faces only made it funnier. However, it also solidifies the overall theme of the differences in which we celebrate the holidays is what makes them special. Something absolutely horrifying to Smolder's friends is a happy and well-accepted story to dragons, as Smolder said. After Smolder's story, Sandbar comes back out. Smolder and Yona get suspicious. Sandbar lives in Ponyville and would be easy to go home, but he tells them he couldn't have done it because he loves spending time with his family, reminding them of a story about how he almost burned his heart's warming doll. It's a bit anticlimactic, but it was nice seeing Sandbar's family. Kinda thought Treehugger was his mom, but eh, she could be his aunt. Huh. 
with his surfer dude personality, that theory isn't too crazy to be perfectly honest. As for his story, yeah, it is pretty anticlimactic, but I have to appreciate how dramatic the episode tries to make it with slow motion editing and Vincent Tong's overly dramatic narration for Sambar's story. The rest react like us, as Yona and Ocellus are finally sent back. Service Dream freaks out that she'll have to miss the three days of freedom. You know, I always found it odd that Twilee and Rainbow suddenly decided to take two of the students at once after doing one at a time since the start. I mean, sure, they could have done it to expedite the interview process, but I always assumed that the reason they did one-on-one -on -one interviews to begin with was to avoid embarrassing the one who would possibly fess up. I personally find interest in the Three Days of Freedom. The first day is spent on the sea to thank it for protecting them from the Storm King. The second day is spent on land to remember their time there, and the third day is spent on land and sea to celebrate their freedom. It reminds me of a real holiday called Yom HaShoah. It's a Jewish holiday of remembering those who passed away in the Holocaust, and to keep the memory of their family members alive. The Hippogriffs celebrate to remember how they endured the fear and pain the Storm King inflicted on them. Wow. I honestly didn't make that connection before. Damn, Silverstream's story just got a lot heavier. But still, I love how the Hippogriffs celebrate both being Sea Ponies and Hippogriffs, showing the love they hold for their past with the Sea Ponies phase, the present for how they can live on Mount Eris without fear of attack from the Storm King, and the future by being both Sea Ponies and Hippogriffs on the third day. Well, after Smolder and Yona come back, they say Twilight is thinking of what to do next as they start to fight, much to Gallus' dismay. He shouts explaining that this wasn't what the holidays are about, explaining that he did it. Well, it was either him or Smolder. Both don't really care about the holidays and can fly. For God's sake, he jumped out the window like a bat out of hell. Yeah, I admit I was thinking it was either of them. But seriously, Gallus' story instantly catapulted him to my second favorite of the Student Six for how much fleshing out his character experienced in just a short story. Instead of just being a normal, grumpy griffin that's cynical about everything, we learn he's the way he is because he's an orphan who has never experienced a happy holiday. Until he met his friends at the school. It's just a subtle reminder to everyone that others may not be as fortunate as you are on the holidays, yet it does it by drawing out sympathy for Gallus to help us understand and think about it for ourselves, instead of making it a cheap sob story like a lot of charity ads. Urge to hug, rising. Poor kiddo. No wonder Grandpa Gruff sent him to Twilight School. But his story hits home for me. As a kid, I lived with my grandma and my mom was never really around. But this is the one time of year I could count on her being home. And it's why I love Christmas. People get together despite their differences and learn to be happy for one day. Sorry if that got a bit sad, but for someone who knows how Gallus feels, it makes me feel glad the writers acknowledged it. Aw, if I had a hugging vector, I'd give you a hug, Fauna. But yeah, Gallus' admittance that his friends changed his perspective on the holidays really touched me and nails just why I adore the holiday season. It's the one time of year some of us get together with people who mean so much to us and remind us just why we care for them. And with learning just how differently the six of them celebrate the season, they all had a central theme of togetherness. Yes, even both Smolders and Gallus's, except that Gallus's had no love or joy to it. It was just a day of complaining and criticizing one another over petty crap. We got to see how much he's changed from his debut in school days due to his friends, that he got angry with it they were accusing each other so vehemently and forgetting their love of their holidays, whereas the old Gallus probably would have egged the five of them on. Yet the episode made it completely understandable why he sabotaged the decorations. To spend just a few minutes more surrounded by his friends, friends that love and support him, friends whom have turned both his life and perspective on life around to become a better griffin and spread that knowledge back to other griffins back home. It just reinforces that it doesn't matter how you celebrate the holidays, but who you celebrate them with. Twilight, Spike, and Rainbow Dash come in saying they heard everything. Gallus apologizes for what he did, explaining that his friend shouldn't have to be punished for his actions. But they insist that they will stay to help Gallus. Rainbow Dash and Twilight see that they've learned their lesson and decide they don't need one-on-one -on -one lessons and invites them to her home for the holidays. And thus the episode ends as the student six clean up the room and get ready to celebrate the holidays with Twilight and her friends. And that was the Hearthwarming Club. Yep, and this was not only one of the best Hearthwarming episodes, but one of the best episodes of season eight. 
One interesting aspect about the whole mystery element to the episode is how even upon rewatching it and knowing that Gallus was the guilty party of wrecking the decorations, the character development and world building that at least five of the six stories held kept the entertainment factor up throughout the time of watching the episode. Hearthwarming Club is another example that shows that just because you may know the answer to a mystery, it doesn't always mean that the predictability ruins a story as long as the journey towards solving said mystery is fun. Which this episode definitely was. Also, now that I think about the title, and the fact that the students had to stay in school a little longer, this definitely reminds me of the movie The Breakfast Club. Thanks for letting me review this episode, Witch Lefty. <laughs> I had a lot of fun today. You're welcome, Fauna. Thanks for coming in to review it. This was honestly a really fun collab. And if you're interested in Mark Fauna's work, her channel will be linked down in the description below. This is Mr. Left Turn, and I hope all of you have a happy holidays wherever you are. Happy holidays, everyone!